Well, as we head into Easter, uh, I'd like to spend these weeks leading up to it focusing on the people who were gathered around the cross on that Friday 2,000 years ago. This was a bizarre collection of humanity with a wide range of interests and all brought these diverse group of people around Jesus and the cross. They were all connected to him. They were all connected to Jesus um, well, in a, a variety of ways. And it, it's a strange scene as you see them all gathered around because they're all like intensely and randomly, and yet all at the same time, they're engaging him while he hangs there, slowly dying before their eyes. The atmosphere that's swirling around Jesus was this unsettling mixture of hate and brutality. At the same time, you see tenderness and compassion. If you got up close and stood there and, and, and listened, there's screaming, there's cussing, there's weeping, there's laughing. There's mocking. And it's just a bizarre atmosphere. It's just, just so weird. There's a lot of blood. Calvary was right by a road. And so people are kind of past streaming by, rubbernecking, you know, like they do. And then on top of it all, around noon, this really eerie, ominous, dark weather condition sets in. It just kind of creeped you out. What is going on here? So I want us to look at that Friday. I want us to look at that Friday 2,000 years ago. And so I want you to get your Bibles and open them up. If you didn't bring one, please grab one out of the rack in front of you and turn to page 834. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. I'm going to start reading in verse 24. There's a lot of passages this morning. You know, we always preach out of the Bible, right? We always go to the Scripture. I really want you to have one in front of you, a copy of the Scriptures in front of you this morning. I want you to be reading through these passages with me. And as I read, I, it, it, it's kind of like, I want you to come in a little closer, please. Uh, when we were in, in Israel, just got back, and uh, there's a group that would go around and the guide and would, would come to some site, and there was some things that he wanted us to see and hear, and he would say, please, 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 gather in a little closer. You know, picture children and the teacher with the book. Okay, kids, gather in a little closer. You, you need to see this. And so, folks, I, I want us to gather in close, please. Come on in a little closer. And I, and I want you to come up closer to the cross, and I want you to, to listen, and I want you to look, and I want you to see. Verse 24, Matthew 27. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, Look, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Now if you are here last week, Rich, Rich did a great job of introducing us to Pilate. And Pilate was trying to figure out who was this guy? Who was this Jesus? Who, who are you? What? 
why are they bringing you here? And well, I don't see anything wrong with you. You're innocent. I don't see anything worthy of death. What's up with you? You're a king? What kind of a king? What is your kingdom? What is truth? What should I do with Jesus? That's a great question. He even stood Jesus up and said, What shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? That is a tremendous question for every single one of us to grapple with. Who is Jesus and what do we do with him? And this is what Pilate was wrestling with. It says, it just mentions in, in passing that he had Jesus scourged. You know, it's interesting that this scene at the cross, the Bible doesn't glamorize the brutality of what was going on here. The, the Bible doesn't, uh, it, it's interesting, it'll just say, Jesus was scourged. When it comes to the crucifixion, it just says, and he was crucified. We, we've got to go to Roman literature, Roman history. We've got to go to these kind of documents to, to find out the details of how brutal this really was. It says, and Jesus was scourged. That meant they tied him to a post and they whipped him. And this, this whip had multiple leather thongs on it. And at the ends were bits of bone or, or lead and the Jews, when they scourged somebody, limited it to 40 minus 1. They wanted to make sure they didn't go over the limit. The Romans, hey, you know, as long as it gave you thrills, you have at it. It, it, would, it would just open up a, a, a guy's back. Uh, slight, it would fillet him. The victim would end up be reduced to a bloody pulp, and they would die. Sometimes they would die. If you saw Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, you saw and will never forget what it was like to be scourged. Verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters or his palace there, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him. You're a king? Hail, king of the Jews. And they spit on him. And they took the reed and they struck him in the head. And when they had mocked him, when they'd had their fun, just totally humiliated him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they went out, they, they left the city walls just outside the city. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. So the Roman soldiers are like, hey, you know, I want this, I want this, I want this. Well, I'll, 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 I'll shake you for it. I'll... They sat down and they kept watch over him there. Apparently at times people would maybe try and come and rescue somebody off the cross before they died. So the Romans' job, the soldiers' job, their, their life was at stake. They had to sit there and guard this whole scene and make sure that guy ended up dead. And over his head, over Jesus' head, they had put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. 
And those passing by, going along the road, derided him, wagging their heads, saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved other people. He can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross. Oh, we'll believe you then. He trusts in God. Yeah. Let God deliver him now if he desires. For he said, I'm the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Then it's crazy, this next verse from the sixth hour, about noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Are you up there? Don't, don't back off. I want, I want to lead you up to the cross. I want you to stand there amongst the people and listen to what is going on. I want you to look at who these people are and I want you to listen to what they're saying. How they're reacting and interacting with Jesus. And this morning, I want to narrow in on one group of people. One group of people. Next week, we'll get another group. Week after that, we'll get another group. This morning, I want to narrow in on the religious community. I want us to focus in and look at the religious community that's there around the cross. Notice verse 41. So the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him. Who were these guys? I mean, the chief priests, they were, you ready? They were the leading men who led the people in worship at the temple. This was the clergy. So when you went to worship God in Jerusalem in the grand temple, the chief priests, these are the leaders of all this. And the scribes, well, these were the Bible experts. These were the experts of the law, they'd say. They studied the Bible. They, they studied the scriptures. They knew the answers. They quoted the verses. These were like the seminary professors. And the elders, well, these are like the leaders of the community. These are the people with the names. You know, every, every community has, has like respected leaders. These were good people, right? These leaders in the community, good guys, respected names. Well, they're, uh, you know, and they're, they're names. You're going to get introduced to the Pharisees. They were also a part of this. Who were the Pharisees? Pharisees were an interesting group of people as well. They were very moral. They were very self-disciplined. They were deeply religious people. They kind of took it up an extra notch. They would be folks who maybe people in the community say, well, they're really into this stuff, this Christianity. They're really into it. Um, they're really serious about their faith, people might say. These guys were serious about being good and living it out. They were serious about that, and, and they, would, they, they were calling the culture to do the same. Hey, wait a second, this isn't right. These guys would, they were, they kind of, they'd be the guys that wear the t-shirt that says, being good is what I do. <laughs> now, in, in their attempts to, to, to live like the scriptures told them to live, they would add a number of things on there, their own convictions, their own rules, their own kind of set of guidelines. It's like if you really want to keep the Sabbath, if you're really spiritual, here's what it looks like. da 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 Those were those guys. If you really want to live like a Christian, well, here's how your hair ought to look, and here's how you ought to dress, and here's what you ought to do here, and here's what you should smoke and not smoke, and whatever, whatever, and here's the kind of people. And we're going to just lay that all out for you. Those are those guys. So these are the people, these are the religious people around the cross. And it's a little shocking. They're the ones who are mocking. They're the ones taunting Jesus. They're the ones throwing his words back in the face. Oh, so you're the son of God. <laughs> you came here to save us. That's nice. 
Uh, you're in pretty rough shape here, pal. <laughs> Isn't he? King of the Jews. Okay, king. I trust in God. Jesus said he trusted in God. Yeah, well, let's see what God does for him now. Wow. And you're a little shocked at this. How, because the, and the question becomes this, the question I want to pose to us is, how did it come to this? How did it come to this? I mean, you just got injected into the middle of the scene here, come on up to the cross, boom. you got to ask the question, how did it come to this? How is it that the people who knew the Scripture, people who led in worship, the respectable, moral, committed to regular spiritual activities group, how did the group that was doing its best to keep the Ten Commandments and compared to most people, they were doing a great job, how was it that the folks that people looked at them and said, well, if anybody's getting into heaven, if anybody's right with God, it's those people, how was it that the religious community was doing this, had this kind of attitude and this kind of statement with Jesus? It's pretty shocking. Let's unpack it briefly. First of all, I want you to see the prediction. The prediction. And what I mean by this is this. As Jesus hung on the cross, he was not surprised at this group's reaction to him. Jesus knew it was coming. Jesus knew people. Mark chapter 8. You're in Matthew. Turn to the next gospel quickly. Mark chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. I mean, it's Mark 8, right? Kind of in the middle of the gospel. Mark chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. And we have this interesting little interjection here in the middle of Jesus' ministry. It says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> Jesus is saying, guys, I want to give you a little heads up here. You know? Um... Things are not going to go well. And here are the people that are going to be really torqued off at me. Chief priests, elders, scribes, they're going to get me killed. All right? But then I'm going to rise from the dead. Peter pulls him aside and says, that's not the Messiah plan here, Jesus. You, you, don't, you don't get it. Jesus is telling them the religious community is going to have me killed. And he says it plainly to them. Now, go to Mark chapter 10. You're in Mark 8. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 32. So this is a little later on. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. The reason... It was getting more and more tense. Jesus coming down to the end. The cross is approaching. He knows it. The other folks don't. He knows it's tense. They know it's tense. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Now, this is pretty amazing. You know, I, I mean, as Jesus hung on the cross and listened to the religious community around him, he was... He wasn't at all shocked. Was he brokenhearted? Yes. Was he at times stunned at their unbelief? Yes. But none of this took him by surprise. All right, let's look at the plot. You say, wow, the religious community was the one that was, yep. Well, how did they pull this off? How did the religious community have Jesus killed? How in the world did they pull this off? 
Well, um, turn to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. You're in the Gospel of Mark, so, so, so back up to Mark chapter 3. I'll begin reading verse 1. Here's an instance that things are starting to heat up. And again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And you're going, what? Well, see, the Sabbath, it was clear in Scripture that the Sabbath was to be holy and the rest, whatever. But what happened, these Pharisees and religious leaders had added all these rules about what you're supposed to do and not do on the Sabbath. And it got ridiculous. Maybe you grew up in an environment. I did. I grew up in an environment where, you know, Sunday, and it was like Sunday's a day of rest. Okay, we get that. Well, let me tell you what that meant, you know. And so they're going to add 97 things. And as a kid, okay, it was Sunday. You don't watch TV. You take a nap. You go, you go, really? Is this, what's going on here? So they had all these rules about what it really meant to keep the Sabbath. And one of them was, you don't heal somebody. And you're going, seriously? And that's what Jesus was thinking. Seriously? So verse 3, he said to the man with a withered hand, come here. And he said to him, looks at the crowd, says to the crowd, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And all the people of the church cheered and applauded, and they were so excited. This poor guy got his hand healed. Nope, that's not what it says. What does it say? The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. A guy gets his hand healed on the Sabbath. These guys go outside, set up a meeting. How do we kill this guy? This guy, this has got to stop. And who's doing it? It's the Pharisees. It's the religious community. And it's the Herodians. You say, well, who are the Herodians? These were the friends and the backers of the Herods. Herod the Great lived, built the temple, a lot of other amazing feats that he pulled off. And then he died, you know, Mary and Joseph down to Egypt. Herod tries to kill the babies in Bethlehem. Well, then he dies, so Mary and Joseph come back. In Herod's place, he had three sons, and they were the Herods. You know, you got Herod Antipas, Herod Archelaus, and, and, these, and they ruled. And so the Herodians were people, these, this was a conservative political group. The Herodians worked with the Roman government to bring about peace and favor and resources to the Jewish people. So for us to kind of connect this in modern day terms, it, you know, you could read verse 6 to say this, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Republicans against Jesus about how to kill him. Now, fast forward, turn to Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26. You're in Mark, back up a book, Matthew chapter 26. This plot, well, how do they pull it off? How did the religious community pull this off? Matthew chapter 26, verse 1. When Jesus had finished all of these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know, after two days, now it's really coming down to the end, after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So Jesus keeps calling this, keeps saying this is coming. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest. we got a church meeting going on here whose name was Caiaphas, what were they doing? Were they deciding the color of carpet? No. They plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, 
we better not do this during the feast lest there be an uproar among the people. So here's what the meeting was about. How do we get Jesus arrested and get him killed without the general population catching wind of this because they're all coming into Jerusalem for Passover and there were a lot of people that like Jesus, you know, the general crowds, hey, he healed their uncle or whatever, and whatever, they were open to it, and they're going, you know, we don't want to start this riot, but we got to get rid of them. So that was their plan. They were trying to come up with a plan. They were plotting. How can we pull this off? And then they got the break that they could have only dreamed of. Verse 14. Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, one of Jesus' inside guys, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. And Judas finally got the perfect opportunity because the Last Supper... Right in the upper room, Judas exits. Jesus and the disciples leave the Last Supper, right? They go outside the city walls, Kidron Valley, up the slope of the Mount of Olives to a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a special place, secluded, private, that Jesus would often go with his disciples. And, and, and Jesus is there, and he's praying, and Judas says, this is the perfect situation. I will lead you to him. It's out of the way, out of the public light. It's nighttime. Grab the temple guard, and let's get this thing done. And so they hauled Jesus off to the religious leaders. He was arrested by the temple guard, and Jesus goes to Annas and then Caiaphas, and then they gather the Sanhedrin together, and they run him through this sick kangaroo court type of trial. They're trying to jump, drum up charges. They're trying to get things together. They're trying to build a case that they can take to Pilate that he's worthy of death. They have great difficulty doing it. It's embarrassing. Finally, they just go, okay, ready, all in favor of death, say aye, and they all go, aye. They blindfold Jesus, they start smacking him around, saying, so you're a prophet, who was it that hit you? And then first thing in the morning, they take him to Pilate and say, this guy is worthy of death. And we pick it up from there where we were last week. So the prediction and the plot. You say, what was the problem here? What, what really fueled all this? What was the problem? Why was the religious community so upset with Jesus? I mean, that's a legitimate question, right? I mean, seriously. I, I remember hearing a guy one time that said that somebody handed him the Bible. He had no connection with the Bible whatsoever. Never read it. Never read anything. He was totally in the dark. He said he sat down and he started reading the Gospels, and he said, you know, I was introduced to this guy named Jesus. What an amazing guy. And he said, all of a sudden, as the story unfolded, he said, I sensed things were turning bad, and he couldn't understand why. And, and he, he described it, he says, what did Jesus ever do against any of these guys? I mean, he just went around healing people, feeding them, teaching them. He loved the kids. He treated women with more respect than anybody had treated them ever before. What's the problem? Well, let me give you a couple examples, and you'll see how the problem became very acute. Turn to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And you'll see how the problem gets clarified and intensified. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. 
Now, what had happened, Jesus was in the city of Capernaum, and a guy, uh, his friends had lowered him through the roof because he was paralyzed, and he comes down right in front of Jesus, and Jesus says, Caesar faith, and says, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and religious leaders, what, what, who's this guy think he is going around forgiving people their sins? And Jesus says, so that you know that I have the authority to forgive sins. He tells the guy to get up and walk, and he did. <laughs> so it's like, whoa. And then it says this, Mark chapter 2, verse 13. He went out again beside the sea, the Sea of Galilee, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Tax collectors were not favorite people among the Jews. These are the guys who are the shady ones. These are the guys who sold out to the Roman government. These are the guys who are working their job, raking the Jews. They were the slimy. They hated them. They hated these guys. And as he reclined at table, now Jesus invites one of these guys into his inner circle, right? And as Jesus reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners, <laughs> all, all the scumbags that Levi hung out with, is what the Pharisees would say. They're all, Jesus is hanging out, and they got a party going. Reclining with Jesus and disciples, and there were many who followed Jesus, verse 16. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. There are a lot of people who are following Jesus, and the religious folks were jealous of this. Pilate picked up on that. It was very obvious to him. And Jesus comes into this setting, and he said, and, and, and what was happening was sick sinners loved Jesus. They were drawn to Jesus. He had compassion on them. He gave them forgiveness, and he gave them hope. See, the sick sinners, they knew they weren't good enough. They looked around and compared themselves to Pharisees and other folks. They knew they weren't good enough. They knew they weren't good people. They knew it. They knew they deserved hell. And Jesus comes up and said, how would you like forgiveness? And how would you like to be right with God? And how would you like hope? And how would you like a fresh start? And how would you like a relationship with all my... And, and these people were thrilled. Now, the religious people, on the other hand, the religious people, they were good people. They were self-righteous. They were pretty good folks, see? And Jesus bothered them. And the reason Jesus bothered them so much was because Jesus pushed past their religious veneer and began to poke at their hearts. Jesus began to expose their hypocrisy. Jesus began to pinpoint their sin. Jesus began to say things like, oh, so you say somebody shouldn't commit adultery. That's great. What I say is this. He who looks at a woman to lust for her has committed adultery already in his heart. How you doing, pal? And they hated him for it. They hated him for it. They came to Jesus and was like, wait a second, wait a second. Are you telling me I'm a sinner? You know how judgmental that is? Are you telling me I'm sick? Are you telling me I'm a sick sinner like those people you're hanging out with? Are you serious? I'm not like one of them. <laughs> and these nice religious folks didn't like him. Didn't like that. This is a problem. Luke chapter 18. Turn to Luke chapter 18. Verse 9. Jesus really drills into it here. Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, 18, verse 9. It'll be on the screen. Watch this. He tells a story, tells a parable, and here's who he directs the story to. He directs the story to the religious community. He directed the story to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. 
Here's what he says. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, that's how religious people pray, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man, went down to his house justified before God rather than the other. You mean that tax-collecting, worthless sinner? Yes. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is really important. Religious people trust in their own good behavior, see? Religious people trust in their record of righteous deeds, Religious people gain a certain confidence in their heartfelt attempts to be good people. Religious people say, you know, good outweigh the bad. I think I'm in pretty good shape, really. And they think that they are justified before God. They say, you know what? God's a loving God. I believe in him. I pray to him. I do my best to be a decent person. I think he loves me. I think I'm going to heaven. That's how religious people think, and that's what they trust in. And Jesus said to those people, that's incredibly arrogant. That's what Jesus said to them. It's incredibly arrogant, and God doesn't buy it. Jesus says, you want to know who God justifies? You want to know who God says, you're okay with me? You want to know who God says, you're on your way to heaven and declares righteous and not guilty anymore? It's the person who brings nothing to God except a plea for mercy because he realizes he's sick. He's sinful and he's sick. And he's got to find somebody that's going to forgive him and deal with his sin and bear his sin and take his sin. Religious people go, man, I'm not that bad. Now, all of this put a little kink in the religious community's program because the crowds were getting excited about this. Jesus was giving them forgiveness no matter how messed up they were. And all these sick people were coming up to Jesus and going, yes, there's hope for me. And the religious community hated the way Jesus exposed their sin and their self-righteousness and their hypocrisy. Now let's bring it a little closer to home as we wrap it up. You say, a little closer to home. Here's a question for us this morning. Are you a member of the religious community? (laughs) Okay. Um, Are you? I would say, you know, if you're here this morning, probably say yes. If somebody asked me, am I a member of the religious community? I'd say yes. Holly, you a member of the religious community? Yes. Uh, raise your hand if you're a member of the religious community. I mean, yeah. Okay, right? I mean, you're here this morning, right? It's not even Christmas or Easter. So we're, we're you know, we're kind of coming to church and checking things out. Now, some of you are here this morning. You're going, wait a second. I'm newer here at Grace don't, Alan, don't you lump me in with the rest of this crew. I'm here just checking it out. Okay, that's cool. You, you, get, a, you get a pass here. But what I, what I, what I want to talk to, what I want to talk to is us church folks, us self-identified religious people. I've got to ask us two questions. The first one is this. Are you a justified sinner Or did you just get religion? There's a big difference. See, what I'm asking is this. Was there ever a moment in your life, is there ever been a moment in your life when you think back and you remember, I remember, when you humbly cried out to God, 
I am sick. I am so deeply sinful, and the burden and the guilt is killing me, and I hate I am sick. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You didn't come to God to join a church. You didn't come to God to say, I just want to get a little more religious. No, you came and said, I need a Savior. I need someone to pay for my sin. And you embrace Jesus Christ. That's what will send you home justified before God. Have you ever had that? Has that ever happened with you? Have you ever had that experience, that encounter? John 3.16, classic verse that a lot of religious people learn. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I love what Andy Stanley says. You don't behave your way into heaven. You believe your way into heaven. This isn't a religious system. This is faith in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. Are you a justified sinner? Or did you just get religion one day? Jesus met one night with a very, very prominent, very prominent religious leader. John chapter 3. It's on the screen. I just want you to watch it on the screen. John chapter 3. Interesting engagement. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. This guy was a prominent member of the religious community. His name was Nicodemus. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus looks into the eyes of a prominent member of the religious community and says, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. Which we as members of the religious community got to ask ourselves this question. Are you a regenerate person or just a religious person? Have you been born again? Jesus said that's the deal. He didn't say, are you a religious person? Nicodemus was a religious person. Nicodemus was in you know, the top ten. Nicodemus was in the, in the upper percentile of being a religious person. And Jesus said, that ain't going to cut it. Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you're never going to see the kingdom of God. Wow, that ought to send shockwaves through the religious community. See, have you been born again? Have you been regenerated? Born again. Generation. Regeneration. Have you been given life? You know, we talk about life in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Are you a new creation? Do you have a spiritual pulse? Has there been a point in your life when you go along, you are dead spiritually? Whoa, I've been made alive. I've been regenerated. You, you, just, didn't, you just didn't decide you were going to try harder. That's religion. Are the religious changes that are coming about in your life, are they a result of an inner birth, a supernatural life of Jesus that permeates and transforms you from the inside out? Or are you just cranking up the outward efforts to get your act cleaned up? I can do better next time. Are you a regenerate person? Or are you just a religious person? It's interesting to me, so we wrap it up, we're around the cross, the people around the cross stay there, Jesus dies, Jesus dies. And we have this interesting scene in John 19, look on the screen and watch. 
After these things, Jesus has died. Okay, there are the bodies up there. The, the, the guards go and they break the legs of the two robbers. They come to Jesus and said, this guy's gone. They run a spear through him. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Watch this. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 70 pounds of weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices as in the burial customs of the Jews. And here's the question I have to wonder. Did Nicodemus move from the religious to the regenerate? Did he? I don't know. He might have. Did it dawn on Nicodemus? Being a religious person is never going to justify me before God. I need a Savior, and Jesus is it. And was Nicodemus, boom, was he born again? The real question is, not Nicodemus, but what about you? Religious people have always gathered around the cross. I've been to Europe and seen a lot of cathedrals in Europe. And you know, most of them are built in the shape of a cross. Going to most churches in America, you'll find a cross somewhere. We've got a cross in every single one of the lights that comes up. There's a nice big gold cross in back of there. We've got crosses everywhere around here. Uh, religious people wear crosses hanging around their neck all the time. So we're, we're the religious community, our people, around the cross. But here's the real question for you. I'm talking to us church folk, us members of the religious community. Are you a justified sinner or did you just get religion one day are you a regenerate person go man something came alive in me or are you just a religious person let's pray I gotta take this moment if the Holy Spirit and God and His Word has just really opened some things up in your heart and mind this morning, and you're saying, oh God, I don't want to just be a religious person. I've got to be forgiven and justified. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You cry out that in your heart right now to God. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then you take your life and your heart and all that you are and you say, God, by faith, I take Jesus Christ as my Savior. God, born something in me. Birth something in me. Make me a new creation. Regenerate me. Forgive me. I've got to have life. I'm sick and tired of trying to be a good person. I'm sick and tired of pursuing the religious route. God, I pray that you would speak very powerfully to us in this room, people of the religious community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.